The Last Supper by T.D. Ham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Supper by T.D. Ham. Hampered as she was by the child in her arms, the woman was running less fleetly now. A wave of exultation swept over Gultrin, drowning out that uneasy feeling of guilt for disobeying orders. The instructions were mandatory and concise. No capture must be attempted individually. In the event of sighting any form of human life, the ship must be notified immediately. All small craft must be back at the landing space not later than one hour before takeoff. Anyone not so reporting will be presumed lost. Wildren thought uneasily of the great seas of snow and ice sweeping inexorably toward each other since the earth had reversed on its axis in the great catastrophe a millennium ago. Now summer and winter alike wrought paralyzing gales and blizzards, heralded by the sleety snow in which the woman's skin-clad feet had left the tracks which led to discovery. His trained anthropologist mind speculated avidly over the little they had gotten from the younger of the two men found a week before, nearly frozen and half-starved. The older man had succumbed almost at once. The other, in the most primitive sign language, had indicated that for several humans living in caves to the west, only he and the other had survived to flee some mysterious terror. Guldrin felt a throb of pity for the woman and her child, left behind by the men, no doubt as a hindrance. But what a stroke of fortune that there should be left a male and female of the race to carry the seed of Terra to another planet. And what a triumph if he, Guldrin, should be the one to return at the eleventh hour with the prize. No need of calling help. This was no armed party but the most defenseless being in the universe, a mother burdened with a child. Guldrin put on another burst of speed. His previous shouts had served only to spur the woman to greater efforts. Surely there was some magic word that had survived even the centuries of illiteracy, something equivalent to the bread and salt of all illiterate peoples. Cupping his hands to his mouth, he shouted, Food! Food! Ahead of them, the woman turned her head, leaped lightly in mid-stride, and went on slowing a little, but still running doggedly. Guldrin's pulse leaped. He yelled again, Food! The instant that his foot touched the yielding surface of the trap, he knew that he had met defeat. As his body crashed down on the fire-sharpened stakes, he knew, too, the terror from which the last men of the human race had fled. Above him the woman looked down, her teeth gleaming wolfishly. She pointed down into the pit, spoke exultantly to the child. Food, said the last woman on earth. End of the Last Supper by T. D. Ham Control Group by Roger D. Aycock This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Control Group by Roger D. Aycock The cool green disk of Alphard Six on the screen was infinitely welcome after the arid desolation and stinking swamplands of the inner planets, an airy jewel of a world that might have been designed specifically for the hard-earned month of rest ahead. Navigator Farrell, youngest and certainly most impulsive of the three-man Terran Reclamation's crew, would have set the Marco Four down at once but for the greater caution of Stryker, nominally captain of the group, and of Gibson, engineer and linguist. Javier, the ship's little mechanical, had, as was usual and proper, no voice in the matter. "'Reconnaissance spiral first, Arthur,' Stryker said firmly. He chuckled at Farrell's instant scowl, his little eyes twinkling and his naked paunch quaking over the belt of his shipboard shorts. "'Chapter 1, subsection 5, paragraph 27. 
no planet fall on an unreclaimed world shall be deemed safe without proper Pharrell, as Stryker had expected, interrupted with characteristic impatience. Do you sleep with that damned reclamations handbook, Lee? Alfred VI isn't an unreclaimed world. It was never colonized before the Hymenop invasion back in 3025. So why should it be inhabited now? Gibson, who for four hours had not looked up from his interminable chess game with Javier, paused with a beleaguered knight in one blunt brown hand. "'No point in taking chances,' Gibson said, in his neutral baritone. He shrugged thick, bare shoulders, his humorless, black-browed face unmoved when Farrell included him in his scowl. "'We're two hundred twenty-six light-years from Seoul, at the old limits of Terran expansion, and there's no knowing what we may turn up here. Alfred's was one of the first systems the bees took over. It must have been one of the last to be abandoned when they pulled back to seventy Ophiuchi. "'And I think you live for the day,' Pharrell said acidly, "'when we stumble across a functioning dome of live buzzing hymenops.' Damn it, Gib, the bees pulled out a hundred years ago, before you and I were born. Neither of us ever saw a hymen up, and never will. But I saw them, Stryker said. I fought them for the better part of the century they were here, and I learned there's no predicting or understanding them. We never knew why they came, nor why they gave up and left. How can we know whether they'd leave a rear guard or booby trap here? He put a paternal hand on Farrell's shoulder, understanding the younger man's eagerness and knowing that their close-knit team would have been more poorly balanced without it. "'Gib's right,' he said. He nearly added, as usual. "'We are on rest leave at the moment, yes. But our mission is still to find Terran colonies enslaved and abandoned by the bees, not to risk our necks and a valuable reorientation ship by landing blind on an unobserved planet.' We're too close already. Cut in your shields and find a reconnaissance spiral, will you? Grumbling, Farrell punched coordinates on the ring-wave board that lifted the Marco Four out of her descent and restored the bluish enveloping haze of her repellers. Stryker's caution was justified on the instant. The speeding, streamlined shape that had flashed up unobserved from below swerved sharply and exploded in a cataclysmic blaze of atomic fire that rocked the ship wildly and flung the three men to the floor in a jangling roar of alarms. "'So the handbook tacticians knew what they were about,' Stryker said minutes later. Deliberately he adopted the smug tone best calculated to sting Farrell out of his first self-reproach, and grinned when the navigator bristled defensively. "'Some of their enjoinders seem a little stuffy and obvious at times, but they're eminently sensible.' When Farrell refused to be baited, Stryker turned to Gibson, who was busily assessing the damage done to the ship's more fragile equipment, and to Javier, who searched the planet's surface with the ship's magnoscanner. The Marco IV, ring-wave generators humming gently, hung at the moment just inside the orbit of Alfred Six's single dun-colored moon. Gibson put down a test meter with an air of finality. Nothing damaged but the zero-interval transfer computer. I can realign that in a couple of hours, but it'll have to be done before we hit transfer again. Stryker looked dubious. What if the issue is forced before the ZIT unit is repaired? Suppose they come up after us? I doubt that they can. Any installation crudely enough equipped to trust in guided missiles is hardly likely to have developed efficient spacecraft. Stryker was not reassured. That torpedo of theirs was deadly enough, he said, and its nature reflects the nature of the people who made it. Any race vicious enough to use atomic charges is too dangerous to trifle with. Worry made comical creases in his fat, good-humored face. We'll have to find out who they are and why they're here, you know. They can't be Hymenops, Gibson said promptly, first because the bees pinned their faith on ring-wave energy fields as we did rather than on missiles, second because there's no dome on six. There were three empty domes on five, which is a desert planet, Farrell pointed out. Why didn't they settle six? It's a more inhabitable world. Gibson shrugged. 
I know the bees always erected domes on every planet they colonized, Arthur, but precedent is a fallible tool, and it's even more firmly established that there's no possibility of our rationalizing the motivations of a culture as alien as the Hymenops. We've been over that argument a hundred times on other reclaimed worlds. But this was never an unreclaimed world, Farrell said, with the faint malice of one too recently caught in the wrong. Alfred VI was surveyed and seeded with Terran bacteria around the year 3000, but the bees invaded before we could colonize. And that means we'll have to rule out any resurgent colonial group down there because Six never had a colony in the beginning. The bees have been gone for over a hundred years, Stryker said. Colonists might have migrated from another Terran-occupied planet. Gibson disagreed. We've touched at every inhabited world in this sector, Lee, and not one surviving colony has developed space travel on its own. The Hymenops had a hundred years to condition their human slaves to ignorance of everything beyond their immediate environment. The motives behind that conditioning usually escape us, but that's beside the point, and they did a thorough job of it. The colonists have had no more than a century of freedom since the bees pulled out, and four generations simply isn't enough time for any subjugated culture to climb from slavery to interstellar flight. Stryker made a padding turn around the control room, tugging unhappily at the scanty fringe of hair the years had left him. "'If they are neither Hymenops nor resurgent colonists,' he said, "'then there's only one choice remaining.' They're aliens from a system we haven't reached yet, beyond the old sphere of Terran exploration. We always assumed that we'd find other races out here some day, and that they'd be as different from us in form and motivation as the Hymenops. Why not now? Gibson said seriously, Not probable, Lee. The same objection that rules out the bees applies to any trans culture. They'd have to be beyond the atomic fission stage, else they'd never have attempted interstellar flight. The ring wave, with its zero-interval transfer principle and instantaneous communications applications, is the only answer to long-range travel, and if they'd had that, they wouldn't have bothered with atomics. Stryker turned on him almost angrily. If they're not Hymenops, or humans, or aliens, then what in God's name are they? Ay, there's the rub. Farrell said, quoting a passage whose aptness had somehow seen it through a dozen reorganizations of insular tongue and a final translation to universal Terran. If they're none of those three, we've only one conclusion left. There's no one down there at all. We're the victims of the first joint hallucination in psychiatric history. Stryker threw up his hands in surrender. We can't identify them by theorizing, and that brings us down to the business of first-hand investigation. Who's going to bell the cat this time? I'd like to go, Gibson said at once. The ZIT computer can wait. Stryker vetoed his offer as promptly. No, the ZIT comes first. We may have to run for it, and we can't set up a transfer jump without the computer. It's got to be me or Arthur. Farrell felt the familiar chill of uneasiness that inevitably preceded this moment of decision. He was not lacking in courage, else the circumstances under which he had worked for the past ten years, the sometimes perilous, sometimes downright carnal conditions left by the fleeing Hymenop conquerors, would have broken him long ago. But that same hard experience had honed, rather than blunted, the edge of his imagination, and the prospect of a close-quarters stalking of an unknown and patently hostile force was anything but attractive. "'You two did the field work on the last location,' he said. "'It's high time I took my turn, and God knows I'd go mad if I had to stay in ship and listen to Lee memorizing his handbook subsections or Gib practicing dead languages with Javier.' Stryker laughed for the first time since the explosion that had so nearly wrecked the Marco IV. Good enough, though it wouldn't be more diverting to listen for hours to you improvising enharmonic variations on the lament for old terror with your accordion. Gibson characteristically had a refinement to offer. They'll be alerted down there for a reconnaissance sally, he said. Why not let Javier take the scouter down for overt diversion and drop Arthur off in the Healy Hopper for a low-level check? Stryker looked at Farrell. All right, Arthur. Good enough, Farrell said. 
and to Javier, who had not moved from his post at the magnoscanner. How does it look, Hav? Have you pinned down the base yet? The mechanical answered him in a voice as smooth and clear and as inflectionless as a cello note. The planet seems uninhabited except for a large island some three hundred miles in diameter. There are twenty-seven small agrarian hamlets surrounded by cultivated fields. There is one city of perhaps a thousand buildings with a central square. In the square rests a grounded spaceship of approximately ten times the bulk of the Marco IV. They crowded about the vision screen, jostling Javier's jointed gray shape in their interest. The central city lay in minutest detail before them, the battered hulk of the grounded ship glinting rustily in the late afternoon sunlight. Streets radiated away from the square in orderly succession, the whole so clearly depicted that they could see the throngs of people surging up and down, tiny foreshortened faces turned toward the sky. Well, at least the human, Farrell said. Relief replaced in some measure his earlier uneasiness. Which means that they're Terran and can be dealt with according to reclamation's routine. Is that Hulk space where they have? Javier's mellow drone assumed the convention vibrato that indicated stark puzzlement. Its breached hull makes the ship incapable of flight. Apparently it is used only to supply power to the outlying hamlets. The mechanical put a flexible gray finger upon an indicator graph derived from a composite section of detector meters. The power generated seems to be gross electric current conveyed by metallic cables. It is generated through a crudely governed process of continuous atomic fission. Farrell, himself appalled by the information, still found himself able to chuckle at Stryker's bellow of consternation. Continuous fission? Good God, only madmen would deliberately run a risk like that! Farrell prodded him with cheerful malice. Why say madmen? Maybe they're humanoid aliens who thrive on hard radiation and look on the danger of being blown to hell in the middle of the night as a satisfactory risk. They're not alien, Gibson said positively. Their architecture is Terran, and so is their ship. Their ship is incredibly primitive, though. Those batteries of tubes at either end— Our thrust reaction jets, Stryker finished in an awed voice. Primitive isn't the word, Gib. The thing is prehistoric. Rocket propulsion hasn't been used in spacecraft since— How long, have? Javier supplied the information with mechanical infallibility. Since the year 2100, when the ring-wave propulsion communication principle was discovered, that principle has served men since. Farrell stared in blank disbelief at the anomalous craft on the screen. Primitive, as Stryker had said, was not the word for it. Clumsily ovoid, studded with torpedo domes and turrets, and bristling at either end with propulsion tubes, it lay at the center of its square like a rusted relic of a past largely destroyed and all but forgotten. What a magnificent disregard its builders must have had, he thought, for the lives and the genetic purity of their posterity. The sullen atomic fires banked in that oxidizing hulk. Stryker said plaintively, "'If you're right, Gib, then we're more in the dark than ever. How could a Terran-built ship, eleven hundred years old, get here?' Gibson, absorbed in his chess player's contemplation of alternatives, seemed hardly to hear him. "'Logic or not logic,' Gibson said. "'If it's a Terran artifact, we can discover the reason for its presence. If not—' "'Any problem posed by one group of human beings,' Stryker quoted his handbook, can be resolved by any other group, regardless of ideology or conditioning, because the basic perceptive abilities of both must be the same through identical heredity. If it's an imitation, and this is another Hymenop experiment in condition ecology, then we're stumped to begin with, Gibson finished, because we're not equipped to evaluate the psychology of alien motivation. We've got to determine first which case applies here. He waited for Farrell's expected irony, and when the navigator forestalled him by remaining grimly quiet, continued, The obvious premise is that a Terran ship must have been built by Terrans. Question. Was it flown here, or built here? 
It couldn't have been built here, Stryker said. Alphard 6 was surveyed just before the bees took over in 3025, and there was nothing of the sort here then. It couldn't have been built during the two and a quarter centuries since. It's obviously much older than that. It was flown here. We progress, Farrell said dryly. Now if you'll tell us how, we're ready to move. I think the ship was built on Terra during the 22nd century, Gibson said calmly. The atomic wars during that period destroyed practically all historical records, along with the technology of the time. But I've read well-authenticated reports of atomic-driven ships leaving Terra before then for the nearer stars. The human race climbed out of its pit again during the 23rd century and developed the technology that gave us the ring wave. Certainly no atomic-powered ships were built after the wars. Our records are complete from that time. Farrell shook his head at the inference. I've read any number of fanciful romances on the theme, Gib, but it won't stand up in practice. No shipboard society could last through a thousand-year space voyage. It's a physical and psychological impossibility. There's got to be some other explanation. Gibson shrugged. We can only eliminate the least likely alternatives and accept the simplest one remaining. Then we can eliminate this one now, Farrell said flatly. It entails a thousand-year voyage which is an impossibility for any gross reaction drive. The application of suspended animation, a longevity, or a successive generation program, and a final penetration of Hymenop-occupied space to set up a colony under the very antennae of the bees— Longevity wasn't developed until around the year 3000. Lee here was one of the first to profit by it, if you remember, and suspended animation is still to come. So there's one theory you can forget. Arthur's right, Stryker said reluctantly. An atomic-powered ship couldn't have made such a trip, Gib, and such a lineal descendant project couldn't have lasted through forty generations, speculative fiction to the contrary. The later generations would have been too far removed in ideology and intent from their ancestors. They'd have adapted to shipboard life as the norm. They'd have atrophied physically, perhaps even have mutated. And they'd never have fought past the bees during the Hymenop invasion and occupation, Farrell finished triumphantly. The bees had better detection equipment than we had. They'd have picked this ship up long before it reached Alfred Six. But the ship wasn't here in 3000, Gibson said, and it is now. Therefore, it must have arrived at some time during the 200 years of Hymenop occupation and evacuation. Farrell, tangled in contradictions, swore bitterly. But why should the bees let them through? The three domes on five were over two hundred years old, which means the bees were here before the ship came. Why didn't they blast it or enslave its crew? We haven't touched on all the possibilities, Gibson reminded him. We haven't even established yet that these people were never under Hymenop control. Precedent won't hold always, and there's no predicting or evaluating the motives of an alien race. We never understood the Hymenops because there's no common ground of logic between us. Why try to interpret their intentions now? Farrell threw up his hands in disgust. Next you'll say this is an ancient Terran expedition that actually succeeded. There's only one way to answer the questions we've raised, and that's to go down and see for ourselves. Ready, have? But uncertainty nagged uneasily at him when Farrell found himself alone in the Healy Hopper with the forest flowing beneath like a leafy river, and Javier's scouter disappearing bullet-like into the dusk ahead. We never found a colony so advanced, Farrell thought. Suppose this is a Hymenop experiment that really paid off. The bees did some weird and wonderful things with human guinea pigs. What if they've created the ultimate booby trap here and primed it with conditioned myrmidons in our own form? Suppose, he thought, and derided himself for thinking it, one of those suicidal old interstellar ventures did succeed. Javier's voice, a mellow drone from the Healy Hopper's ringwave-powered visicom, cut sharply into his musing. The ship has discovered the scouter and is training an electronic beam upon it. 
my instruments record an electromagnetic vibration pattern of low power but rapidly varying frequency the operation seems pointless stryker's voice followed querulous with worry i'd better pull hav back it may be something lethal don't gibson's baritone advised surprisingly there was excitement in the engineer's voice i think they're trying to communicate with us Farrell was on the point of demanding acidly to know how one went about communicating by means of a fluctuating electric field when the unexpected cessation of forest diverted his attention. The Healy-hopper scudded over a cultivated area of considerable extent, fields stretching below in a vague random checkerboard of lighter and darker earth, an undefined cluster of buildings at their center. There was a central bonfire that burned like a wild red eye against the lower gloom, and in its plunging ruddy glow he made out an urgent scurrying of shadowy figures. "'I'm passing over a hamlet,' Farrell reported. "'The one nearest the city, I think. There's something odd going on down—' Catastrophe struck so suddenly that he was caught completely unprepared. The Healy Hopper's flimsy carriage bucked and crumpled. There was a blinding flare of electric discharge, a pungent stink of ozone, and a stunning shock that flung him headlong into darkness. He awoke slowly with a brutal headache and a conviction of nightmare heightened by the outlandish tone of his surroundings. He lay on a narrow bed in a whitely antiseptic infirmary, an oblong metal cell cluttered with a grimly utilitarian array of tables and lockers and chests. The lighting was harsh and overbright, and the air hung thick with pungent, unfamiliar chemical odors. From somewhere, far off, yet at the same time as near as the bulkhead above him, came the unceasing drone of machinery. Farrell sat up groaning when full consciousness made his position clear he had been shot down by god knew what sort of devastating unorthodox weapon and was a prisoner in the grounded ship at his rising a white smocked fat man with anachronistic spectacles and close-cropped gray hair came into the room moving with the professional assurance of a medic the man stopped short at farrell's stare and spoke his words were utterly unintelligible but his gesture was immistakable Farrell followed him dumbly out of the infirmary and down a bare corridor whose metal floor rang coldly underfoot. An open port near the corridor's end relieved the blankness of wall and let in a flood of reddish Alfardian sunlight. Farrell slowed to look out, wondering how long he had lain unconscious, and felt panic knife at him when he saw Javier's scouter lying port open and undefended on the square outside. The mechanical had been as easily taken as himself then. Stryker and Gibson, for all their professional caution, would fare no better. They could not have overlooked the capture of Farrell and Javier, and when they tried, as a matter of course, to rescue them, the Marco would be struck down in turn by the same weapon. The fat medic turned and said something urgent in his unintelligible tongue. Farrell, dazed by the enormity of what had happened, followed without protest into an intersecting way that led through a bewildering succession of storage rooms and hydroponics gardens, through a small gymnasium fitted with physical training equipment in graduated sizes, and finally into a soundproof place that could have been nothing but a nursery. The implication behind its presence stopped Farrell short. "'A crush,' he said, stunned. He had a wild vision of endless generations of children growing up in this dim and stuffy room to be taught from their first toddling steps the functions they must fulfill before the venture of which they were a part could be consummated. One of those old ventures had succeeded, he thought, and was awed by the daring of that thousand-year odyssey the realization left him more alarmed than before for what technical marvels might not an isolated group of such dogged specialists have developed during a millennium of application such a weapon as had brought down the healy hopper and scouter was patently beyond the reach of his own latter-day technology perhaps he thought its possession explained the presence of these people here in the first stronghold of the hymenops perhaps they had even fought and defeated the bees on their own invaded ground 
he followed his white-smocked guide through a power room where great crude generators whirred ponderously pouring out gross electric current into arm-thick cables they were nearing the bow of the ship when they passed by another open port and Farrell, glancing out over the lowered rampway, saw that his fears for Stryker and Gibson had been well grounded. The Marco Four, ports open, lay grounded outside. Farrell could not have said later whether his next move was planned or reflexive. The whole desperate issue seemed to hang suspended for a breathless moment upon a hair-fine edge of decision, and in that instant he made his bid. Without pausing in his stride, he sprang out and through the port and down the steep plane of the ramp. The rough stone pavement of the square drummed underfoot. Sore muscles tore at him, and weakness was like a weight about his neck. He expected momentarily to be blasted out of existence. He reached the Marco Four with the startled shouts of his guide ringing unintelligibly in his ears. The port yawned. He plunged inside and stabbed at controls without waiting to seat himself. The ports swung shut, the ship darted up under his manipulation and arrowed into space with an acceleration that sprung his knees and made his vision swim blackly. He was so weak with strain, and with the success of his coup, that he all but fainted when Stryker, his scanty hair tousled and his fat face comical with bewilderment, stumbled out of his sleeping cubicle and bellowed at him, "'What the hell are you doing, Arthur? Take us down!' Farrell gaped at him, speechless. Stryker lumbered past him and took the controls, spiraling the Marco Four down. Men swarmed outside the ports when the Reclamation's craft settled gently into the square again. Gibson and Javier reached the ship first. Gibson came inside quickly, leaving the mechanical outside, making patient explanations to an excited group of Alfardians. Gibson put a reassuring hand on Farrell's arm. "'It's all right, Arthur.' There's no trouble. Farrell said dumbly, I don't understand. They didn't shoot you and Hav down, too? It was Gibson's turn to stare. No one shot you down. These people are primitive enough to use metallic power lines to carry electricity to their hamlets, an anachronism you forgot last night. You piloted the helicopter into one of those lines, and the crash put you out for the rest of the night and most of today these alfardians are friendly so desperately happy to be found again that it's really pathetic friendly that torpedo it wasn't a torpedo at all stryker put in understanding the error under which farrell had labored erased his earlier irritation and he chuckled commiseratingly they had one small boat left for emergency missions and sent it up to contact us in the fear that we might overlook their settlement and move on the boat was atomic powered and our shield screens set off its engines farrell dropped into a chair at the chart table limp with reaction he was suddenly exhausted and his head ached dully we cracked the communication problem early last night gibson said these people use an ancient system of electromagnetic wave propagation called frequency modulation and once lee and i rigged up a suitable transceiver the rest was simple both Hav and I recognized the old language. The natives reported your accident, and we came down at once. They really came from Terra? They lived through a thousand years of flight? The ship left Terra for Sirius in 2171, Gibson said. But not with these people aboard, or their ancestors. That expedition perished after less than a light year when its hydroponics system failed the hymenops found the ship derelict when they invaded us and brought it to alfred six in what was probably their first experiment with human subjects the ship's log shows clearly what happened to the original complement the rest is deducible from the situation here farrell put his hands to his temples and groaned the crash must have scrambled my wits gib where did they come from from one of the first peripheral colonies conquered by the bees gibson said patiently the hymenops were long-range planners remember and masters of hypnotic conditioning they stocked the ship with a captive crew of terrans conditioned to believe themselves descendants of the original crew and grounded it here in a disabled condition they left for alfred five then to watch developments 
Succeeding generations of colonists grew up accepting the fact that their ship had missed Sirius and made planetfall here, they still don't know where they really are, by luck. They never knew about the Hymenops, and they've struggled along with an inadequate technology in the hope that a later expedition would find them. They found the truth hard to take, but they're eager to enjoy the fruits of Terran assimilation. Stryker, grinning, brought Pharrell a frosted drink that tinkled invitingly. "'An unusually fortunate ending to a Hymenop experiment,' he said. "'These people progressed normally because they've been let alone. Reorienting them will be a simple matter. They'll be properly spoiled colonists within another generation.' Pharrell sipped his drink appreciatively. "'But I don't see why the bees would go to such trouble to deceive these people. Why did they sit back and let them grow as they pleased, Gibb? It doesn't make sense.' "'But it does, for once,' Gibson said. "'The bees set up this colony as a control unit to study the species they were invading, and they had to give their specimens a normal, if obsolete, background in order to determine their capabilities.' the fact that their experiment didn't tell them what they wanted to know may have had a direct bearing on their decision to pull out farrell shook his head it's a reverse application isn't it of the old saw about terrans being incapable of understanding an alien culture of course gibson said surprised it's obvious enough surely hard as they tried the bees never understood us either End of Control Group by Roger D. Aycock Recording by Thomas Rose A Husband for My Wife by William W. Stewart This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. A Husband for My Wife by William W. Stewart I admit it, he beat my time, but my day is coming. Any minute now, time is about to run out on him. Soon, very soon now, the time will come for me to meet my wife's husband. I can hardly wait. Every dog has his day, and Professor Thurlow Benjamin has just about had it every day has its dog too and i am going to return to him with full five years interest the bad time he gave to me the dog dog look he stole my girl not once but twice the second time he you might say took his time to beat my time and left me behind to the bad time that belonged to him benji is or he was and he will be a scientifically sneaky two-timing dog and a dog's life is what he gave to me but now after nearly five years time is on my side he will get what minute by minute is coming to him not soon enough but soon benji professor thurlow benjamin was my oldest closest friend i was his we hated each other dearly in the way that only two boyhood pals can and by chance or mischance that quality of bitter friendly boyish rivalry never left our relationship why a woman naturally the first time we met he was a tall gangling red-headed big-nosed kid of nine i bull for bullard benton was shorter stockier heavier maybe not handsome exactly but clean cut very clean cut benji knocked a chip off my shoulder and i knocked his block off but not without collecting a few lumps doing it from then on we fought together against any one else when no one else was handy we fought each other and naturally we each wanted what the other had after high school we roomed together at burnington university right there in our home town belt city benji was a brain a scholar i was an athlete so he broke nearly every bone in his body trying to be a six foot three one hundred and thirty nine pound scat back 
while i nearly sprained a brain that was deep definitely deep but maybe not quite as quick on its feet as some trying for scholarship the last year and a half at the university the competition between us narrowed down to a battle for vera milston old dean milston's statuesque daughter that was all a mistake i can see it now so can benji but not then dean milston was the dourest sourest meanest old tyrant ever to suspend a football captain for a couple of unimportant d's one afternoon in junior year at basketball practice benji was out dragging around a cast jocko bunter bet me ten i didn't have the nerve to date the dean's daughter well hell i'd seen her around visiting the dean as regularly as i had to she was a lot of girl tall honey blonde a little on the regal commanding side and maybe her lips were a mite set over a chin that the old man should have kept to himself but there are times when a young man doesn't analyze the details as carefully as he might she was built like nothing i had tackled all fall so i took a chance got a date one ten and that might and should have been that she had a way of saying no that made me think of her father but the thing was benji didn't know about the bet i dated her once so he had to date her twice again i didn't analyze i jumped to the conclusion benji had the hots for her and went to work to cut him out that kept us busy the next year and a half and i led all the way vera and i got engaged at the spring prom to be married right after my graduation which improved the odds on my graduating considerably the dean was a grim old devil who considered hamlet a comedy and could refuse anything to anyone except vera and how could i have known it was fear rather than affection that made him give in to her anyway perhaps the strain of passing me a diploma was too great the next day the old devil passed on himself and no matter where he may be sitting i know he is happy as long as he can watch the others fry but i shouldn't grumble he saved me unintentional though it was vera possibly having second thoughts as she looked over the dean's list said she couldn't marry me till after a reasonable period of mourning the army took me and rejected benji he stayed on for postgraduate study in physics i told you he was a brain a brain but not equally acute in all fields when i got back to belt city three years later benji was already an assistant professor of physics and vera's husband they were settled in the old dean's big ancient house just off the campus and benji was aiming or being aimed at a distinguished academic career i came back to town with the idea of winding up the family insurance and real estate business and pulling out mostly to keep away from them it wasn't you understand that i was carrying such a heavy torch for vera she hadn't blighted my life not then that is but it seemed to me that living in town with her and professor thurlow benjamin a gloating triumphant benji laughing at me because he'd succeeded in marrying my girl would be a real annoyance but of course when i hit town i had to call them and they had to invite me to dinner for one time anyway i figured i had to accept i gritted my teeth and went i never had a sweeter more enjoyable evening in all my life i got there about seven in the evening and walked up the steps to the big old porch on the dean's house feeling a bit nervous and upset i had walked up those same steps often enough before feeling nervous and upset but this was different i lifted the oversized brass knocker and rapped vera's voice coming from the back of the house some place cut through the evening air thurlow answer the door yes sweets i'm on my way vera hunbun that was benji hunbun yet and his voice was misery it cringed and whined i grinned to myself and began to feel more cheerful benji let me in his glasses were thicker and his hair thinner and he looked a lot older but it was benji 
the same old lanky gangling redhead yet not the same too he had a hang-dog look that was new and suddenly i felt so good i punched him playfully in the ribs he winced and didn't even counter if the fight hadn't gone out of him it had sure been watered down we went on into the parlor across the hall from the dean's old study vera joined us she didn't look bad at a glance but if you checked right close and i did there was something in her look a sharpness i hadn't noticed before her nose seemed bigger beak-like the broad solid shoulders deep down grooves at the corners of her mouth she threw her arms around me and kissed me my temperature stayed steady and cool boulard boulard darling you look marvellous i felt great too vera girl you're as gorgeous as ever radiant blooming still the campus goddess and mrs thurlow benjamin now hmm old benji is sure a lucky dog benji forced a hollow laugh vera smiled a positive agreement then benji sort of coughed out a faint note of hope and pleaded vera sweet this is uh, an occasion don't you agree dear don't you uh, do you think maybe i ought to fix us all a drink thurlow you drink far too much you had a highball before dinner at professor dorman's only night before last almost but not quite i felt sorry for him ah well vera doll i said this is an occasion after all and i do want to drink a toast to you and benji hm. especially you the love of my life lost now but lovelier than ever boulard well thurlow don't stand there like an idiot go mix us some drinks and mind the line on the bottle and then she turned back with some more gush for me i enjoyed it knowing now what i had been saved from in fact as i said i enjoyed the whole evening my playing up to vera made her just that much rougher on benji revenge on benji plus relief at what i had escaped made life seem pleasant and right there and then i changed my mind about leaving town i decided to stay and settle down well i did settle but not too far down instead of selling out uncle george's insurance and real estate firm i went to work in it it was prosperous enough and light work there were plenty of girls around town if you got around and i did looking back those were the happy years naturally i kept seeing quite a bit of vera and benji rubbing it in sure why not hell half the pleasure in any success comes from giving a hard time to those who gave you a hard time it may not be nice but it is normal i lolled in the shade and laughed benji sweated and suffered his boss's whip cracked merrily he plodded ahead in the university physics department and fiddled around his lab whenever he could escape into it then there came a black friday evening in early autumn i was due with benji's for dinner just him and me vera had gone up to chicago that morning to see her ever dying aunt bella and do some shopping she would not be back till the next day so she called on me to keep an eye on benji so i was due for a quietly pleasant early evening listening to benji talk about his sorrows then i figured benji would go to his lab in the old dean's study and i would go out on the town i had a date one of the very best starlight glow formerly daisy hansel formerly an office clerk she was a pert little strawberry blonde cute with a lot of good humor and a lot of everything else too about as unlike vera as a girl could be that week she was between nightclub engagements back in her old home town and back in the old groove with me too i looked forward to the evening first benji's troubles and then my own pleasures i pulled up in front of benji's old place just at dusk a late working lineman from beltsville power was fiddling around on the pole outside benji's lab room hey mac he hollered you going in there look tell the prof they'll cut it in at seven a m huh 
can't make it a minute sooner i nodded as i went up the steps and across the porch knocked once walked on in and stopped dead in the hallway to stare up the stairs it was benji but not the vera's benji i was used to he was dressed in the evening clothes vera got him to wear only at major faculty functions he carried a cane wore a flower tonight he was benji man about town knight of the evening sharp cool cocky he strutted on down the stairs and passed me he winked grinned that dirty sneaky grin of his i remembered all too well from the old days at the door he looked back over his shoulder still grinning and said stick around a minute old boy i have something to show you the door slammed shut i couldn't believe it he wouldn't dare then i heard my car my new sport car starting outside and i swore grabbing the doorknob wait bull you couldn't catch me i spun around damned if it wasn't old benji coming down the stairs again just as though it wasn't impossible this time he looked himself but worse he had on an old lab smock and a new hangover he looked awful but with a hint of satisfaction too like remembering the time he'd had getting into such lousy shape well bull boy he mumbled wavering on down the steps holding the top of his head on with one hand come on out in the lab maybe we could find a little nip and i have something to show you so you said eh oh yes so i did last night when i was going out it was just now only you went out all dressed up and here you are all beat up what's this all about come on he said with a flash of temper when i get a hair or two of the dog i'll explain it to you i followed him into his lap the dean's old study it was the only thing benji could call his own vera let him have it on the off chance that he might find something important enough to give their social and financial position a boost in the lap benji fished an amber-filled flask from the wastebasket under the old roll-top desk and poured himself a double me a single in a couple of big test tubes i only half saw him out of a corner of the eye what i was really looking at was a damned peculiar rig that filled up about a third of the space along the side wall next to the kitchen it was i couldn't figure it it looked something like one of those jungle gym outfits in the kids playgrounds but there were wires running from it to half a dozen wall plugs and a seat up in the middle with a bunch of dials and things it was all odd and oddest was the way it all sort of shimmered and blurred as i watched it what in hell is that i walked across the lab toward it reaching out better not touch it bull you might knock something out since he put it like that i raised my hand to grab hold of one of the crossbars by the seat in the center of the thing and there i was resting comfortably on a small cloud in far outer space watching a great spiral nebula whirling in infinite majesty through the vast empty blackness and i thought about the mystery of the universe i felt that if i could just reach out i would have in my grasp the final answer but then it drifted away and the nebula slowly narrowed and evolved into a great system of suns planets moons and finally into the big old chandelier in the dean's study when it all seemed to stabilize at that point i sat up a little shakily the room benji's lab now was still there i stood up and felt lousy my head ached i looked around benji was sitting at the desk slumped over his head on his folded arms the flask of whiskey half gone was on the desk beside him i emptied it out a little more into me and checked my watch six o'clock and the sky showed gray outside i had been out all night i put my foot on the base of benji's swivel chair and shoved hard the chair rolled back out from under him he slumped down with a pleasing thud on the floor he woke up with a pained expression that helped my headache a little damn you benji i said you did that out of spite to break my date with daisy i bet he yawned 
I told you you'd better not touch it. Because you knew, then, I'd have to go ahead and do it. It's a wonder, with me knocked out, you didn't go to try to steal my girl. I did. I am. You what? I did go out with Daisy. I am with her now. Are you cracked? You are right here with me. True, but I am simultaneously with Daisy. He grinned reflectively. And I don't mind saying Daisy is much better company than you. Now, wait, Bull. I know this is difficult for you to grasp, but it is a fact that I am in two places at the same time, only on different circuits. This is big, Bull, really big. After you help me with one or two details, I am going to share it with you. Listen to me. Sometimes I can be sickeningly gullible. All right, start explaining. Think, Bull. Last night you saw me go out the front door. At substantially the same time, you also saw me, dressed quite differently, come down the hall stairs. It should be obvious. I have built a time machine. I looked down at my watch and then back at him with raised eyebrows. No, Bull. Not a machine for telling time. A machine for traveling through time, or, actually, more or less around it. You see my machine there? The jungle gym rig was still at the side of the room, blurred and shimmering. Yeah, I see it, and don't bother telling me not to touch it again. I won't. Your own fault. Ordinarily, you could touch even one of the bars. It is perfectly safe. But just now, the machine is there, twice. That creates further static force fields. Benji, look at it. Looks as though you were seeing double, hmm? And you are. You see, Bull, this coming morning at ten to seven, I took, and will take, the machine, and I traveled back to ten to five yesterday afternoon. At that time, the machine was already there. Actually, I should have moved it just before I used it this morning to limit the overlaps, but I was rushed. You'll see. Daisy and I will be here shortly, he grinned. It was an expression I had never particularly cared for. Have another drink, Bull? That was an expression I liked better. I did have one. His story was unbelievable, but I was beginning to believe it, partly because of the machine there and the fact that I had seen two of him practically at once the evening before, partly because I knew Benji would be capable of almost anything if it would let him steal a girl from me and get away from Vera besides. He took a short nip himself and went on. I won't strain your limited facilities by trying to give you the technical side of it. More or less, it is a matter of setting up the proper number of counteracting magnetic force fields properly focused in a proper relationship each with the other to bend the normal space factors in such a way as to circumvent time. Is that clear? Not to me, I said. Is it to you? Not altogether, but what is clear is this. My machine works. I can jump through time, to any time. Got any special messages from Cleopatra? The amount or period of time is a question of power. With only the regular house current I have connected now, about a day at a step is the limit. That is as far as I have gone. Of course, I could go one day, and then another, and then another forward or back indefinitely with more current there would be no such limitations how about taking a run up to the end of the week and let me know how the world series is going to come out ah now you begin to see i told you this is a big thing tremendous and all i ask is just a little help from you and you will share in the proceeds what me help how I had the power company run in a special power line yesterday. It will cut in this morning at seven. With this added power, the machine can travel five years. Five years at a jump, which as far as I, we, that is, want to go. Well, just suppose what you say is true, Benji. If it is, then you used your sneaky machine to two-time me with Daisy last night, eh? 
i like that vera will like that too but you expect to bribe me with a share in your rig to help you out how with what bull it's like this i did go out last night my first time in a long time you know vera so considering the past few years you can understand that i was eh, maybe a bit reckless last night ran into a few little problems nothing serious of course and besides with your help the police won't be able the police yes but bull you've been right here with me all night you can swear to that so i couldn't possibly have driven your car up the steps and through the glass doors into the ancient history section of the museum my car now bull we'll make money you can get lots of cars and i didn't mean to smash up yours i simply wanted to give daisy a rough idea of a time trip back into the past but you can tell the police i was right here when someone broke out through the window by the neanderthal exhibit while the police were coming in the front door after us so someone else must have driven off in the police car you stole the police car i yelped oh we won't keep it he said airily but perhaps they are upset about our borrowing it and about the duet of as time goes by that daisy and i sang over the police radio lord and when did you finish all this fun and games i demanded when well, let's see it's six forty a m so we daisy and i are on our way back here now in the patrol car now you and daisy in the patrol car the one we borrowed the police they seem to have a lot of cars are not far behind i believe they think they recognize me you can tell them how wrong they are he stopped to listen i heard it too a sound of sirens in the distance coming closer so benji in a minute or so you a second edition of you when one has always been plenty you are coming here with all the cops in town on your tail and with my girl and you expect me to step forward and lying in my teeth tell these enraged cops that you are innocent this is quite a request benji there was the roar of a car racing down the quiet saturday dawn street benji looked at me anxiously here we come bull please you wouldn't turn me over to the police would you no i didn't want the cops to get him i wanted to get him myself and let vera finish him there was a sound of running footsteps up the porch stairs the hallway door opened arm in arm laughing like a pair of idiots in came benji benji too and my girl daisy they staggered across the room benji too threw his arms around daisy and kissed her with conviction and assurance then quickly he stepped away from her and walked over to the time machine rig hurry it up said the first benji quick the power will cut off any second now until they switch in the new line drunk or not benji too knew what he was doing he dragged the straight chair by the wall to the side of the machine and climbed it he swayed almost fell then without touching any of the bars he managed to step from the chair into the seat of the machine rig he fiddled with the dial or knob and vanished the double exposure look of the machine disappeared too benji said daisy staring blankly at the machine daisy said the leftover benji walking toward her the sound of sirens outside sounded loud and louder and then moaned to a stop in the front of the house benji daisy said again giving me and the sirens about as much attention as an individual aunt gets at a family picnic benji it was true then all that you were telling me about going through time was true and we can of course sweet i told you i'd be with you that everything will be all right with good old bull to help us what time have you bull huh i was dazed the time what time is it it's just about seven but heavy footsteps pounded up the front stairs and across the porch the front door knocker thundered 
bull said benji bull old friend i think there may be someone at the door would you see who it is i don't know why i didn't make him go answer i still don't know but i walked out into the hall from the lab and opened the front door and nearly got trampled by a squad of four cops headed by big tough sergeant winesap there were i saw through the open door two squad cars parked out front and another coming down the block just behind a taxi oh said winesap it's you benton say you weren't in this crime wave too were you we only saw two that madman friend of yours professor benjamin and the girl in your car look you know what they did they knocked off three hydrants whooping about time in the fountain of youth and wrecked the museum and the police car and what they did to officer durlin maybe you weren't in on it benton but we know they came in here friend or no friend don't try to obstruct justice where are they yes officer inquired benji bland as could be from the lab door what seems to be the trouble did you wish to see me his manner must have been disarming at least they didn't shoot him on the spot they just advanced loosening guns and holsters like a thoughtful lynching party benji strolled back into the lab and over to daisy who was standing by the machine at the side of the room the officers were confused benji sober or nearly so in his old lab smock looked a good deal different to them from the wild man they'd been chasing all over town but there was daisy in her evening gown that's them all right said a young rookie with a fine blooming shiner she's the one that threw the eggplants i'd know her anywhere and that's benjamin said winesap grimly okay both of you don't try to run come along and no more nonsense benji held up one hand and slipped the other arm around daisy's waist gentlemen please i have no idea what this is about but surely it can have nothing to do with me mr benton and i have been right here in my laboratory all night working he can verify that they looked at me i opened my mouth i didn't say a word vera did she stood there in the doorway it must have been her in the cab coming back bright and early from chicago she took in the whole scene benji daisy police me benji she said you couldn't imagine what she put into that one word everyone turned then to look at her slowly and with infinite menace she started across the room now dear said benji nervously now sweet take it easy this is only a little experiment not what you are thinking at all we swung back toward benji he had boosted daisy onto the seat of his time rig and swung up beside her vera yelled and started to run toward them benji twisted a knob and grinned good-bye now he said and they were gone benji was gone again daisy was gone the whole rig was gone vera looking a little forlorn and foolish ended up her dash stumbling into the empty space where the thing had been i expect we all looked a little foolish standing there gaping but i had to carry foolishness to the ultimate of idiocy vera at that single moment seemed sort of sad and helpless and lord knows i was mixed up i walked over and put an arm around vera saying there there vera hun it's all right i'm here i should never have called her attention to it there i was and the hell of it was i had kept playing up to her all this time just to needle benji when that morning i put my arm around her i never had a chance i was married to vera i still am it has been a long long time almost five years by the calendar centuries by subjective time i am vera's husband sitting by the light of a kerosene lamp in dean millstone's old study which had been benji's lab writing benji and daisy got away and i got caught but now i can smile about it now after nearly five years you understand 
with the power he got into his machine from the new power line he said he could go just five years at a jump of course away from vera probably he figured on going further that he would go the power limit of five years stop and then jump again and again far enough for complete safety but i have had a lot more time to figure than he did i am figuring on a little party a little reception in honor of our first intrepid time traveler a surprise party it will be five years to the hour since daisy and benji left benji will be the surprise since only i know that he will pop up in our midst it will surprise benji it will surprise vera and our guests among whom i have included sergeant captain now winesap and the others of his squad eccentric a party like that i suppose but to vera and the others it is a breakfast anniversary party the anniversary of the very moment of our engagement vera is flattered enough to be tolerant and even pleased at this romantic notion and since i know i have only one out and that is coming i am dutiful cringing and servile that is husband so vera indulges me in a harmless eccentricity or two my other little eccentricity is electric power i don't favor it i use benji's lab the old dean's study as my den i claim to be writing a historical novel i need realism atmosphere i have had all electric power lines removed from that entire section of the house there is no power none that's why i'm writing by lamplight our anniversary party will be here the lamps and candles and the dawn of a bright new day will be light enough when to the total astonishment of vera and our guests benji and daisy and the time rig suddenly appear among us i will greet them with enthusiasm but this will be as nothing to the greeting they will get from other sources benji will work his dials and controls frantically nothing will happen no power vera will step forward the hell with whether the statute of limitations may or may not have run out on benji's assorted legal crimes and misdemeanors the wrath of vera accepts no limitations benji will have run out of time and it will be my time then End of a husband for my wife by william w stewart there is a reaper by charles v devet this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ivan avatician there is a reaper by charles v devet doctors had given him just one month to live a month to wonder what comes afterward there was one way to find out ask a dead man the amber brown of the liquor disguised the poison it held and i watched with a smile on my lips as he drank it there was no pity in my heart for him he was a jackal in the jungle of life and i i was one of the carnivores it is the lot of the jackals of life to be devoured by the carnivore suddenly the contented look on his face froze into a startled stillness i knew he was feeling the first savage twinge of the agony that was to come he turned his head and looked at me and i saw suddenly that he knew what i had done you murderer he cursed at me and then his body arched in the middle and his voice choked off deep in his throat for a short minute he sat tense his body stiffened by the agony that rode it unable to move a muscle i watched the torment in his eyes build up to a crescendo of pain until the suffering became so great that it filmed his eyes and i knew that though he still stared directly at me he no longer saw me then as suddenly as the spasm had come the starch went out of his body and his back slid slowly 
down the chair edge. He landed heavily, with his head resting limply against the seat of the chair. His right leg doubled up in a kind of jerk before he was still. I knew the time had come. Where are you? I asked. This moment had cost me sixty thousand dollars. Three weeks ago, the best doctors in the state had given me a month to live, and with seven million dollars in the bank, I couldn't buy a minute more. I accepted the doctor's decision philosophically, like the gambler that I am. But I had a plan, one which necessity had never forced me to use until now. Several years before, I had read an article about the medicine men of a certain tribe of aborigines living in the jungles at the source of the Amazon River. They had discovered a process in which the juice of a certain bush, known only to them, could be used to poison a man. Anyone subjected to this poison died, but for a few minutes after the life left his body, the medicine men could still converse with him. The subject, though ostensibly and actually dead, answered the medicine men's every question. This was their primitive, though reportedly effective, method of catching glimpses of what lay in the world of death. I had conceived my idea at the time I read the article, but I had never had the need to use it until the doctors gave me a month to live. Then I spent my $60,000, and three weeks later I held in my hands a small bottle of the witch doctor's fluid. The next step was to secure my victim, my collaborator, as I preferred to call him. The man I chose was a nobody, a homeless, friendless, non-entity, picked up off the street. He had once been an educated man, but now he was only a bum, and when he died, he'd never be missed. A perfect man for my experiment. I'm a rich man because I have a system. The system is simple. I never make a move until I know exactly where that move will lead me. My field of operations is the stock market. I spend money unstintingly to secure the information I need before I take each step. I hire the best investigators, bribe employees and persons in positions to give me the information I want, and only when I am as certain as humanly possible that I cannot be wrong do I move. And the system never fails. Seven million dollars in the bank is proof of that. Now, knowing that I could not live, I intended to make the system work for me one last time before I died. I'm a firm believer in the adage that any situation can be whipped, given prior knowledge of its coming, and, of course, its attendant circumstances. For a moment, he did not answer, and I began to fear that my experiment had failed. Where are you? I repeated louder and sharper this time. The small muscles about his eyes puckered with an unnormal tension, while the rest of his face held its death frost. Slowly, slowly, unnaturally, as though energized by some hyper-rational power, his lips and tongue moved. The words he spoke were clear. I am in a... a tunnel, he said. It is lighted dimly but there's nothing for me to see. Blue veins showed through the flesh of his cheeks like watermarks on translucent paper. He paused, and I urged, Go on. I am alone, he said. The realities I knew no longer exist, and I am damp and cold. All about me is a sense of gloom and dejection. It is an apprehension, an emanation, so deep and real as to be almost a tangible thing. The walls to either side of me seem to be formed not of substance, but rather of the soundless cries of melancholy of spirits I cannot see. I am waiting, waiting in the gloom for something which will come to me. 
That need to wait is an innate part of my being, and I have no thought of questioning it. His voice died again. What are you waiting for? I asked. I do not know, he said, his voice dreary with the despair of centuries of hopelessness. I only know that I must wait. That compulsion is greater than my strength to combat. The tone of his voice changed slightly. The tunnel about me is widening, and now the walls have receded into invisibility. The tunnel has become a plain, but the plain is as desolate, as forlorn and dreary as was the tunnel. And still I stand and wait. How long must this go on? He fell silent again, and I was about to prompt him with another question. I could not afford to let the time run out in long silences. But abruptly the muscles about his eyes tightened, and subtly a new aspect replaced their hopeless dejection. Now they expressed a black, bottomless terror. For a moment I marveled that so small a portion of a facial anatomy could express such horror. There is something coming toward me, he said. A beast of brutish foulness. Beast is too inadequate a term to describe it, but I know no words to tell its form. It is an intangible and evasive thing, but very real, and it is coming closer. It has no organs of sight as I know them, but I feel that it can see me, or rather that it is aware of me with a sense sharper than vision itself. It is very near now. Oh God, the malevolence, the hate, the potentiality of awful fearsome destructiveness that is its very essence, and still I cannot move. The expression of terrified anticipation centered in his eyes, lessened slightly, and was replaced instantly by its former deep, deep despair. I am no longer afraid, he said. Why? I interjected. Why? I was impatient to learn all that I could before the end came. Because, he paused, because it holds no threat for me. Somehow, some day, I understand, I know that it too is seeking that for which I wait. What is it doing now? I asked. It has stopped beside me and we stand together, gazing across the stark, empty plain. Now a, a second awful entity, with the same leashed virulence about it, moves up and stands at my other side. We all three wait, myself with a dark fear of this dismal universe, my unnatural companions with patient, malicious menace. Bits of, he faltered, of, I can name it only aura, go out from the beasts like an acid stream, and touch me the hate and the venom chill my body like a wave of intense cold. Now there are others of the awful breed behind me. We stand, waiting, waiting for that which will come. What it is, I do not know. I could see the pallor of death creeping steadily into the last corners of his lips, and I knew that the end was not far away. Suddenly a black frustration built up within me. What are you waiting for? I screamed. The tenseness and the importance of this moment forcing me to lose the iron self-control upon which I've always prided myself. I knew that the answer held the secret of what I must know. If I could learn that, my experiment would not be in vain, and I could make whatever preparations were necessary for my own death. I had to know the answer. Think! 
Think, I pleaded. What are you waiting for? I do not know. The dreary despair in his eyes, sightless as they met mine, chilled me with a coldness that I felt in the marrow of my being. I do not know, he repeated. I... Yes, I do know. Abruptly, the plasmatic film cleared from his eyes, and I knew that for the first time since the poison struck, he was seeing me clearly. I sensed this was the last moment before he left, for good. It had to be now. Tell me! I command you! I cried. What are you waiting for? His voice was quiet as he murmured, softly, implacably, before he was gone. We are waiting, he said, for you. The End End of There Is a Reaper by Charles V. DeVette Recorded by Ivan Avetisian